So let's just talk about fundamentalism for one second. What is fundamentalism as I use that word there? It's not an easy thing to define. How would you define fundamentalism there? Take a stab. Black and white, whatever. A kind of no, looking. I'm not, I'm not referring to racial black and white. I'm referring right. To it's, it's, you don't interpret anything. So seeing the world in kind of black and white terms, OK? Yeah. All right, what else? What is fundamentalism? Strict interpretation. Kind of a strict. Kind of a strict and literal interpretation. Um, we use that uh, certainly, we could say, of Scripture. Uh, in their case, the Quran. In our case, the Bible. Right? Strict and literal interpretation of Scripture. I'm not even sure they'd use the word interpretation. They might use the word reading. Hold the populace down. Don't teach them anything. No education. Okay, so that's certainly one of the one of the characteristics, right? To hold the populace down. Not a lot of education. Just tell them what they need to know, kind of stuff. Intolerance. All right, intolerance of contrary views. All right. Um, hold populace down. All right. Yeah, I think that's. Go ahead. I would add ignorance. Ignorance. It certainly can be ignorance. Um, I wouldn't want to say that to Muslim, uh, to fundamentalist congregations that are in Bloomington. Uh, all right, in Rochester. Bloomington is my last church. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I also see it as permission giving. Fundamentalism can be permission giving? Yes. In what kind of way? Uh, permission to act and behave in a way that society as a whole may not support, but I can justify it by my fundamentalist belief. Okay, so let's use a different word for that, because permission giving sounds too positive. What is it? Justification. Okay, so it's kind of the back of that justification, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I certainly, that certainly can be permission giving, but we, I usually use that in a positive sense. And in this case, it's, it's just, it's an excuse. It's justification. It's I can do whatever I want to, because these people are infidels, right? These people that we're fighting against, even if they're Muslim, they're infidels. They're not true Muslims. They're not true believers. Okay, so that gives us a little picture. A lot of this stuff, by the way, fundamentalism is a, is a, is a reaction to a rise of modernity. And, you know, you could argue that a lot of the Christian fundamentalism and, and Islamic fundamentalism happened at, at similar kinds of times. I read a book. Is it called, what's it called? Radical Phenomenon. Beyond fundamentalism, and or I'm going to talk about that at the end of the session, but one of the more provocative books I read was that book, uh, with Beyond Fundamentalism, listed on the, on the back page, um, because I think it talks about fundamentalism occurring at many, many, many different levels. And, uh, in ancient Judaism, think about the Zealots. Think about, think about Judas, Iscariot. Uh, some people think that Iscariot had to do with the knife that he carried. And they were fundamentalists. They were radicals. They were radicals that were out to fight Rome. And they were maybe the ones that provoked the Jewish-Roman uh, War that went on from 66 to 73 AD. Uh, the temple destroyed in 70 AD. Uh, there's been fundamentalists around for a long time. There, and some of them have taken matters into their own hand through violence. And that's certainly what's happening today. So I found that provocative. Um, if there is one great cause for the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, according to Zakaria, it is the total failure of political institutions in the Arab world. Doesn't that just hit home? As the moderate majority look the other way, and maybe we have done some of that too as Americans, because they have been our friends, right? They have been our allies. We have gotten oil from them, and, the way, and they have helped keep the peace, and a variety of other things that have happened. Islam is being taken over by a small, poisonous element, people who advocate cruel attitudes toward women, education, the economy, and modern life in general. Probably true. On top of everything, Arabs are angry with the United States' support of Israel. When Israel became a state in 1948, Palestinians were displaced. Do you remember how this happened? Do you remember this story? 
you know, there was a lot of anti-Semitism that was happening in Europe in the late 1800s. And they, I, I think people looked around, Theodor Herzl and others, and said, we got to get out of this place. We just have to get out of this place. And so they began to think of a homeland. And they looked, really, thought about all sorts of possibilities, maybe South America, maybe other places. But then eventually, no, it, maybe it could be Palestine. Maybe it could be that homeland for us. And so they started moving in. And they started raising money, and they started buying up land from a lot of Arab settlers. And they moved in really quite peacefully. But after a while, the Jews owned pretty much a, a good chunk of Palestine in the process. Now, I don't have time to get into the politics of that. I'd save that for another day. But boy, you know, you, you move in, and then suddenly, you know, World War II happens, and Great Britain uh, is trying to get rid of the headache called Palestine. And so there's a UN, you know, sanction and, or charter, I guess, and Israel becomes a state in 1948, and Palestinians are displaced, and it's been the end of the world. Uh, it's been the cause uh, of all causes for the Arab world um, because of what they did in displacing those Palestinians. The anger deepened in the wake of America's support for Israel during the wars of 67 and 73, and the fact that Israel was successful in those wars and humiliated Muslims and Arabs in the process. And ever since, in its relations with the Palestinians, the daily exposure to Israel's iron-fisted rule over the occupied territories has turned into the great cause of the Arabs and indeed the broader Islamic world. Now, let's be honest. Very few of the Muslims around the world are doing much for the Palestinians and their suffering. They're not. But it sure is a cause that excites them and, and stirs them and, and perhaps becomes yet another excuse to justify anger. What could they do? Well, we got, that's a whole other class. That's a great question. Um, that's a great question, but uh, yeah. What could you do? You could do humanitarian aid. They could send in millions of dollars, right, to Palestinians? They, 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 have, they have oil money. They could send in millions of dollars to Palestinians if they wanted to. I was at a conference. It's not just what Israel It is a whole other subject. We had, we had an Israeli Jew talking against Israel. Yeah. It just blew away. Yeah. We're not going down that road today, but it's a it's a great question, and it's a hard it's a hard question. I don't have the answers. That's for sure. Here's another theory: understanding jihad. David Cook. Contemporary radical Muslims like Palestinian Abdallah Azam have emphasized that jihad, and he's using it in terms of lesser jihad, right? Holy war. And jihad alone would resurrect the Muslim world, recreate the primal Muslim society from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, okay? Unify world Muslims, Ummah, uh, and be a worldwide power for the proclamation of Islam. The eventual goal is to liberate the Muslim world and recreate its glory. Doesn't that just sound like a rising up out of the dust bowl? Uh, a rising up out of humiliation? This is a chance to live in a way that perhaps they haven't lived in a very long time. Maybe they go back to the golden age. Azam's call to battle was based on the hope that warfare would revolutionize Muslim society and turn it away from failure and impotence. Osama bin Laden studied with Azam. Okay, so, you know, to some extent, they're just trying to wake people up. They're just trying to wake people up. Folks, you have been asleep. You have not been following in the ways that have been handed down to us and the Sharia that's been handed down to us. Wake up, live rightly, live faithfully according to what we've received from Muhammad and from God. Conspiracy theories, this is a part of this struggle, are alive and well in the Muslim world. The internet doesn't exactly help, does it? And it doesn't really help them sometimes, and it certainly doesn't help us either. There's plenty of stuff that you've passed on to me uh, since this class started that gets passed all around the United States, and, and, and I suppose the world. And some of that stuff, hopefully we're learning more so we know better how to sift some of that stuff, right? Hopefully we're educated enough so we can sift, because a lot of that stuff is just plain old wrong. Conspiracy theories. 4,000 Jews didn't show up for work on 9-11, right? You've all heard that. But when you, get, when you hear that, 
After 9-11, then you begin to believe, well, who really, who really orchestrated that? Or, you know, one of the theories was that the United States orchestrated this, so we'd have an excuse to justify our invasion of Afghanistan and, and, Af and, uh, and Iraq, right? That theory's alive and well. I think I heard something yesterday in the paper uh, about Yemen, and their president was saying uh, something about the dissent in their country, and it's all orchestrated by Israel, who takes their orders from Washington. It's alive and well. And, uh, you know, we used to think Al Jazeera did this. I don't think, Al I think Al Jazeera's got more respect than that. But those theories and those rumors are all over the place. And don't forget electing a non-resident Muslim as president either. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> non-resident non Muslim who grew up in Indonesia or some other place. Yeah. Jesse Ventura, I believe that, doesn't he? Pardon? Jesse Ventura. You know, I haven't kept up with Jesse lately. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 